you have your Bibles available, please turn to the book of Colossians tonight. Uh, we'll be taking a view of Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. We'll read to start off our study tonight, just the first five verses, and I'll endeavor in the next 30, 40 minutes or so to cover verses 1 through 10. Colossians 2, 1 through 10. And as you're turning there, uh, I had heard a potential, and I want to say hello to uh, my stepdad, Larry, who should be watching tonight. Hi, Dad. Good to see you. Uh, he's up in Montana, and after this temperature hike that we're about to face, I think I wouldn't mind being there tonight, too. Uh, 45 or 50 degrees at night doesn't sound bad at all, does it? Amen. Amen. All right. Colossians chapter 2. Verses 1 through 5, we'll read, Paul the Apostle, writing from prison, says, For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom, speaking of Christ Jesus, are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the Spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. And I want to minister on a subject tonight taken from the first verse of our text, one word, conflict. Conflict. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to minister, to touch on your word, to equip your people in this time with the word of God that is able to save their souls and graft it into their hearts and minds. We pray tonight for the leading and guiding and the operation of the Holy Spirit, that he would come and have his way, both through the preacher and those listening. And we'd ask this all in Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen and Amen. Anytime you study a book of the Bible, it's important to know the background, the setting in which it uh, is occurred, the setting in which the writing has taken place. And as I've already mentioned, Paul is writing one of his four prison epistles. Uh, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon are those. And Colossians has a special set of circumstances around it, and you need to understand those circumstances before we can really grasp a hold of the text to interpret it right. There is a young man that is pastoring some 100 miles outside of Ephesus by the name of Epaphras. And we believe very strongly that he is the planter of the church in Colossae. Paul had never been there. But Paul had spent about three years training and teaching uh, in the arena of Ephesus in the school of Tyrannus and other areas there. And out of that school went ministers of the gospel who left with the message and the understanding of this new covenant that Paul taught and that Paul preached. And Epaphras was one of those young men. He traveled about a hundred miles to the area of the Tri-City area of Hierapolis, Laodicea, and Colossae, and started a wonderful church in Colossae, started a powerful church in Colossae, and using the knowledge that he had gained from the Apostle Paul, and the understanding of the new covenant, and we know that what that young man had was an understanding of Christ and him crucified. Paul would have taught him the value of the cross, the value of the new covenant, the entrance of the Holy Spirit into the heart and life of the believers. And of course, everything looked good as it began, as the church was starting to expand and the church was starting to grow. All of a sudden, the devil does what the devil always does. He comes in and he begins to ruin what God wanted to build by bringing in a variety of voices and 
different thoughts into the hearts and lives of the believers. Now, as you study the book of Colossians, there are four major themes or voices that seem somewhat evident there that were conflicting and fighting against what Epaphras would have taught. And the ears of the converts of Epaphras were starting to be inundated with talks of Jewish legalism, the need to still maintain the law of Moses as well as to accept Christ. And in addition, there was oriental mysticism mixed in. We see in the book of Colossians a study or a part of that dealing with angels and other mystic applications that were being given to these converts and bringing confusion. Not only was there Jewish legalism and oriental mysticism, but there was also early Gnosticism. It would have had to have been early because this was written probably in 6061. So Gnosticism was a, an error that was fully developed in the second century, but it would have started. And there's some evidence in Paul's writings that Gnosticism was there. And then the big daddy Greek philosophy. A Greek philosophy ruled the day of that world. And from Athens and the other areas of Greek, the prognosticators of man's philosophies uh, began to eke their way into the hearts and minds and lives of all those new converts. And the simplicity of the gospel was threatened because these other voices began to be raised up. And Epaphras doesn't know quite what to do because he had at first a group that was listening to him preach Christ and him crucified. Trust in Christ. Depend upon Jesus. Depend upon who he is and what he has done. And the Holy Spirit will help you live out this Christian life. And then the legalists came in and the, uh, again, the Gnosticism and the mysticism and the philosophy began to invade the hearts and minds of his people people, and Epaphras needs some support. He needs a little help, and he's not quite sure what to do, but I'm so glad that that Epaphras traveled or decided to travel a thousand miles, and in those days, a thousand miles was no simple journey. A thousand miles to the city of Rome where Paul happened to be. I'm glad that he didn't look at Alexandria, which was the center of man's learning with the great library there, and run down to Alexandria to get his answer, to find out how to deal with the problems. I'm glad he didn't run down to Jerusalem and try to get the head of Judaism and understand what was happening there. I'm glad he didn't stop at Athens and try to get the philosophies of the world to solve the problems of the early church. Instead, as this conflict began to arise, he didn't go to the vaunted halls of learning or the magnificent hills of Judaism and, 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 and all the things that were there. Instead, he's looking for a little, history tells us, a little bow-legged bald man that's chained to a praetorian guard in a rented house in Rome. He will travel a thousand miles one more time just to hear what it is that his mentor, his teacher, this apostle of grace, the apostle Paul had to say about how to live for God and how to run the church and where to go. A thousand miles to just tell Paul, Paul, tell me one more time the message of the cross. One more time. Give me the content of the gospel. I need a little help up in here. A thousand miles to go to where most men would have disdained and most men would have discounted uh, the, the advice or the influence or the education of this apostle Paul. But Epaphras knew that Paul understood the gospel. He'd seen the power of God at work in his converts, and he knew that these opponents to the gospel had to be stifled, and he himself... When we run into opposition and none of much of it sounds good, it, 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 it's kind of mixed with Scripture and it begins to trouble our minds. We're not quite sure what to believe and what to add to the simple gospel. 
And Epaphras himself, I'm sure, needed a little help in his thinking. Paul, tell me the gospel one more time. Tell me the gospel one more time. Let me tell you something, folks. In this last day, you're going to need to hear the gospel again and again and again and again. The voice of the truth has to ring loud and clear and as often as the voice of the opposition that will come to cause you to steal your faith, to rip away the fabric of what you have believed and rip away the truth that has been ensconced into your heart and soul by the power of the Holy Spirit. Tell me that gospel, Paul. One more time, would you travel a thousand miles on foot just to hear it? One more time, ladies and gentlemen. Or if it's raining out, will you just not be able to get to church? He goes to Paul and he tells him the problem in Colossians of the epistle is that answer. And then the first chapter, Paul basically again begins to cause Christ to be preeminent. Can I just say to you that in your faith, keep it simple. Make Christ preeminent. This is all about Jesus. It's not about our church. It's not about a denomination. It's not about a doctrine. It's about a person, the Son of God, who loved you and gave himself for you, died on the cross and rose again. And one day you placed your faith in him and everything changed. It's just that powerful and it's just that simple. And Paul points in the first chapter to... Jesus, making him preeminent. And then as the second chapter starts, he says this to the people in Colossae, and it would have been spread to Laodicea and other churches, but he says, For I would that you know what great conflict I have for you. A true minister of the gospel has a conflict in his heart in regard to the people of God being inundated with false direction and false doctrine. There's a conflict going on in the Apostle Paul. And, and, and it's, this word conflict actually is, has the idea of a physical contest. There's a conflict, there's a battle going on in the Apostle Paul, just like there's a battle going on in the hearts and minds of Christians and people in Colossae, and there's a battle going on for the heart and life of people today. We have never had more opposition than we have ever seen. Our country is divided. Our nation is divided. We're divided socially. We're divided politically. We're divided spiritually. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in a time of conflict. We live in a time of conflict. I said, we live in a time of conflict. You better put your big boy pants on and get ready to fight the good fight of faith because where we're headed is going to take somebody that knows the gospel, understands the gospel, and won't be swayed or moved from the simplicity that is in Christ. There's a conflict. There's always the spiritual battle. The voices haven't changed. They have different names, but they pull at the mind and the heart of the believer, trying to get them to move away from Christ in the cross, trying to move away from the simplicity of Christ. And there's a conflict. In the book of Galatians, Paul said to his converts that had been inundated by the voices of Judaism and legalism, he said, there were some that trouble you. And, and when you hear the other gospel and it's mixed with scripture, you can be confused and your heart can be troubled because the last thing a true believer wants to do is fail God, miss God. And if this man who looks to be a preacher or that teacher seems to know what they're talking about and I'm doing it wrong and they're telling me that what I've believed isn't correct, then the heart becomes troubled. We want to do the right thing. Somebody wave at me if that's you. We want to live right. We want to do what the Bible says. And voices that are contrary to the simple gospel will trouble the heart and mind. And Paul says, I want their hearts, these that have been troubled, to be comforted, being knit together in love. Let me tell you something. The gospel is the only thing that can comfort the heart of a human being. 
The true gospel is the only thing that can deal with the mind and the emotions and the problems of the human psyche, the problems of the human heart. The gospel has it in its content, the ability to take over and crush anxiety and depression and opposition to life and life more abundant. The gospel has what you need in it. I said the gospel has what you need in it. All things pertaining to life and godliness are in the gospel, the simple gospel of Christ. You need comfort today. You're discouraged. You're disappointed. You're downtrodden. The gospel holds the answer. All things pertaining to life and godliness is available to those who will fight the good fight of faith, not be switched off of the gospel by the modern voices or the voices not so modern that cause doubt and fear. In relationship to what you believe, my friend, there is a... There is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He can deal with your hurt. He can deal with your discouragement. He can deal with your fear. He can deal with every aspect of the human soul. Paul says, I want the hearts of the children of God in Colossae to be comforted, being knit together in love. Now watch what he says in verse 2. Unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding. Now I've got to move through this fairly rapidly, but the idea is when we truly understand the gospel, there are riches. I'm not talking about the dollar. I'm talking about the riches that is required of the heart and mind and soul of a human being. There are riches when we are fully assured that the gospel that we're embracing, the gospel that we're teaching, the gospel that we're sharing is sufficient to meet the needs of mankind. It doesn't just save us for eternity, but it transforms us into new creatures in Christ Jesus. Our hearts can be chained. Sins, bondages can be broken. We can experience all manner of life. If we understand what Jesus died to provide for us, if we understand the value, and that's what he means by, he says, comforting their hearts by bringing them to the full riches and understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God. Now, Paul is one of those guys that is so wordy, sometimes we lose him. But when he says this, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, what he's saying is you need to have not just knowledge, but you need to have experiential knowledge of these riches that will assure you that what you are hearing and what you are experiencing is the true gospel. It will help you through depression. It will help you through fear. It will help you through anxiety. It will help you through the marriage situation. It will help you through an economy that's failing. It will help you through a government that doesn't know which way to turn. It will help you maneuver through everything that we face. And not just with, not just with a false hope, not just with an, oh, well, it doesn't matter what's going on around me, but with a full knowledge of what's going on in your world, but yet with a comforting power of the grace of God active in your heart and active in your life. You don't have to leave home without Jesus. You need to take him with you and you need to have an experiential knowledge of what he can do for you in the midst of your issues, in the midst of life. Well, the things are going good or things are going not so good. Jesus is still the base. Jesus is still the foundation. Jesus is the one who can make your life worth living. I'm preaching better than you are, amen, but I'll take every amen I can get. Paul says, I need you comforted by the assurance that you gain and the riches that you gain from finding experientially that Jesus is enough. That Jesus is enough. Money won't fulfill you. Relationships won't fulfill you. But Jesus is enough. The acknowledgement of the mystery. He's speaking of Christ, verse 3, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He's got it all. 
In Him is all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So you see what Paul is doing to the people being inundated by the false gospels, the false directions, the false words. He's directing them back to the content of the gospel and saying, if you understand the gospel, if you understand how it works, and you're allowing it to work in your life, you're going to find the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, and it's going to establish you. It's going to strengthen you. It's going to keep you in these days of conflict. Verse 4, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Everything around us is going to try to move us from faith in Christ and the cross. Everything in the church, everything in the world, everything in education, everything is going to try to maneuver us away from simple childlike faith in Christ. That's what the world does. That's what the devil does. That's what religion does. But I tell those of you here at Family Worship Center, if you've been here any time at all, you have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. You've heard that if you place your faith in Him, that the grace of God through the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit will come and freely work and supply. Are you experiencing that? Are you looking for that? Oh, not just when you walk through the door. I love it when you shout in church, go ahead and sing and shout and raise your hand and dance. But when you face your world, when you go out into your job and you deal with your family and you deal with your life, are you experiencing this grace that the gospel can bring you? I'm telling you, I am. It's not always simple and it's not always easy and at times you have to fight through the opposition just to keep your eyes on Jesus. But that's what I'm trying to get you to understand tonight. The conflict is there to see whether or not you'll stay fast and, and keep your eyes and keep your heart focused on Jesus, who He is and what He has done. Because in it you will find grace. Paul said, and I, I say this to you, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. There's going to be a lot of things that will pull at you. And man, it'll sound logical. It'll sound reasonable. It'll be mixed with Scripture. But it won't be Christ in the cross. It won't be Christ and Him crucified. It won't be faith and grace. It'll be some other aspect of religious activity. And it will pull you out of the safe place. It'll pull you out of the secret place where you can be exposed and destroyed. Paul said, I am praying for you and telling you that don't let any man beguile you with enticing words, words that grab at your heart. He said, for though I be absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. The conflict then is the same, and the conflict now is the same. That these same voices with different titles coming from different directions are all trying to steal our eyes and our heart and our faith from the simplicity that lies in Christ and Him crucified. The gospel that saves and the gospel that secures and the gospel that transforms. Conflict. Conflict. But even in the conflict, in verse 5, he says, I'm seeing that some of you are still hanging on. Some of you are still steadfast. Some of you haven't been moved by the false voices. Some of you haven't altered the object of your faith since you heard that it ought to be Jesus and what he's done for you at Calvary. You haven't changed your mind about the simplicity of the power of the grace of God. You haven't changed your mind about the experiential moving of the Holy Spirit that you have as a result of your faith, not as a result of what you do, not how well you do certain things of religion, but how your faith is centered in Jesus and Jesus alone, and how the Holy Spirit brings you peace, brings you direction, brings you life, brings you excitement, brings you help and your time of discouragement and furthers your joy to an ecstatic level you never thought could, you could have. 
There's still some of us hanging on to the gospel. In this conflict, there still be some of us. Are you one of them? I said, are you one of them? Are you still counting on Jesus? Are you still looking to Jesus? Do you know he's in your life because of what he's done for you at Calvary? And that alone. Paul then goes on to say, I'm glad there's a few, but let me just say this in verse 6. You're going to be in a conflict, and there's some of you that are staying, but he's going to give us the answer as to how to maintain in the conflict. Are you ready? Here it comes. Pretty complicated. Look out. Wordy Paul. Here it comes. Are you listening? Are you there? Are you ready? Here it comes. This is how we maintain in this conflict. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. What? As you have received, how'd you receive him? How'd you receive him? How did he first come into your life? How did he enter your life? What great, magnificent work of religion did you do to qualify for Jesus to show up into your heart? Well, I, Brother Larson, I, uh, I, I just believed. Right answer. That's it. As you have received Christ Jesus, so walk ye in him. 176 times the term in Christ, in him is used in Pauline writing. In him, in whom, in Christ. Why? Because the moment you saw yourself as a sinner and recognized your need for a Savior and said, Jesus, and you called out to him. What he did for all of humanity's sins on Calvary was applied to your life. And all those sin stains were washed away. All the doubt and the fear can be gone. You've been accepted into the beloved. You've become a part of the kingdom of God. You've been forgiven. You've been regenerated. You've been changed. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit took up residence within you. And what did you do? You said, Jesus, save me. You didn't understand a lot of theology. You just understood that you were in desperate straits, that you needed something you couldn't supply for yourself and somehow you knew that you knew that you knew that you knew are you alive on Wednesday night that you knew that Jesus was the answer and by faith you said Jesus the son of David have mercy on me and like blind Bartimaeus of so many years ago instantly spiritual sight came instantly you were relieved of the burden of sin knowing somehow that the burdens of your heart were rolled away it's not complicated ladies and gentlemen look at us (laughs) we can't fix ourselves We can't change ourselves. God didn't ask you to change yourself and get ready for Jesus. He's just said, accept him and I'll change who you are. Accept him and I'll transform you. The night he found me, I wasn't looking for him. Oh, you could tell the story yourself. I've told it so many times. Three-day drunk, cocaine, alcohol, picked up a Bible and started to read it, saw my need for a Savior, and I didn't know what else to say. I knew the, I knew the story. I was raised in church. I, I, I knew the story, but I had never seen myself as a helpless sinner, and basically my, my response to the gospel was, if you'd have me. And here's the good news. 
And he's never turned one away. Never turned one away. I didn't do anything but express faith in him who he is and what he had done for me. And instantly, life changed. And nearly 40 years later, life is still changing. And even when I'm in the conflict, even when I'm facing opposition, even when I see the giants of my life, even when I see the giants of circumcision, even when my heart is crushed or my hopes are dashed, I can still look up into the eyes of a loving Savior and receive the grace I need to take one more step and one more day full of the Holy Ghost, full of the love of God, full of hope and life because of Jesus and what he's done. And as you have received him, that's how you walk. That's how you live. What did you do when you first came? You believed in him. So what should you do tomorrow? Believe in him. What should you do the next day? Believe in him. When, when, when things happen you don't understand, what do you need to do? Call on him. What do you need to do? Believe in him. Believe that what he did for you at Calvary made him a constant companion. You'll never be lonely again. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother traveling through every vicissitude of life. Paul knows this and he tells the church in Colossae, don't listen to the other voices. They can't furnish you with this. As you have received Christ Jesus So walk you in Him. And what's going to happen? You're going to be rooted. My friend, you're already in the vine. You're rooted in Him. And that root, it says, got to hurry. Not only will are you rooted, but once you're rooted, if your faith is maintaining in Jesus and what He's done, you'll be built up in Him. You'll be established in the faith. You'll find out experientially that Jesus is enough. That your faith in Christ is enough. I don't care how the family acts. I don't care how the boss acts. I don't care how your wife acts. Hi, honey. I don't care how the world around you is revolving. I'm telling you, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's faithful. You'll be rooted and built up and established in him. Not in yourself, not in religion, not in philosophy. In Jesus. In Jesus. We need to just have a come back to Jesus revival. Drop all the traditions and the religion and just come back to simple faith. In Jesus and what he's done. Verse 8, beware... He said in this conflict, lest any man spoil you. Beware means you have to keep your eyes open. And that doesn't mean that the pastor's keeping his eyes open for you. I just said that wrong. You got to do this yourself. You're going to have to enter in. You're going to have to do something other than just come to church. You're going to have to, okay, watch out now. You have to do something more than just watch SBN. You're going to have to get up and face life with the knowledge of Jesus in your heart and in your life. And you're going to have to let it impact every relationship, every situation, everything that you're going through in life. And then... You need to develop a prayer life. You need to talk to Christ. Not so that it will make you a Christian, but because He is there and you can talk to Him. I'm not earning brownie points when I go out and pray. I'm doing the only thing that makes sense. I'm talking to somebody smarter than me that knows more than I. Come to think of it, there's nothing he can't do. He's able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that I could ever ask or think. Why would I turn to anything else? But you better in this conflict be praying. We've got phone addiction. 
<laughs> Some of you need a little Bible addiction instead of your phone addiction. Oh, I can't live without it. I can't live without it. You better get your nose in the book and your heart in the heavens. You better get your eyes on Christ because this conflict will try to rob from you. You beware. Well, my husband, no, ma'am, you beware. Well, my pastor, no, sir, you beware. Lest any man spoil you, rob you, rob from you what you have. The word spoil literally in the Greek means to not just rob you, but take you captive. You need to watch out for any kind of doctrine that takes you outside of faith in Jesus and what he's done. And say, no, sir, thank you very much. That's not for me. I think I'll just stick with what brought me in. As I have received him, so let me walk in him. Rooted, build up, established. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy. What men think. <laughs> Vain deceit, and that's tied to the word philosophy. Oh, that was a Holy Spirit raspberry, if you didn't know. Traditions of men. In the church today, I'm afraid oftentimes our traditions have become more precious than Scripture. And we better make sure if we believe something that you can find it in the Bible. You need to ask the question, can you give me scripture for that? Because what you're going to hear in the days and years to come from a variety of voices will cause this conflict to come to its head. You need to be. I got saved reading a Bible. It's been my life since day one. It's still my life. And now you better make sure that there's not traditions of men and philosophies and vain deceits, things that aren't scriptural that you're holding to. Are you a student in the scripture enough to know? I'm not here to spank you, but I sure want to encourage you because this conflict that we're facing isn't going to get less. It's going to increase. You've got to base your life off the Word of God. Beware. Be careful. Watch closely. Test and evaluate. Got to hurry. Do you know... that all those things will not lead you, in verse 8, after Christ. See that? Philosophy, vain deceit, tradition of men, rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Verse 8, going into 9. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Christ, in him dwells. Who the one you counting on? Who are you depending on? You're counting on the one that in him dwells, never leaves, all the fullness of the Godhead, everything that God is, everything that God has, everything that God can do is in Christ, and it's in him. And guess where you are? Guess where you are? Come on, somebody, talk to me up in here. Where are you? You're in Him. And in Him dwells the fullness of the Godhead. All that God is, all that God has, all that God can do. Why would you look to another source? Why would you look to another means? Why would you yearn for something other than the simplicity of Christ and in cru and Him crucified? In Him shall all the fullness of the Godhead dwell bodily. Come on, singers, come back. Listen, listen, listen. Verse 10. And you... You are complete in Him. You are complete 
in Him. The moment you said yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit immersed you into the body, into the person of Christ. You became one with Him. You are in Him, and He in you. And honey, you don't need nothing else. Bad grammar, great preaching. Because understand in this conflict, everything you need is in Jesus. Everything you will ever have to have, spiritually, emotionally, physically, it's in Jesus. You can't get it from tradition. You can't get it from legalism. You can't get it from philosophy. You can't get it from all the rigmarole that men try to bring us to. You are, listen, you are complete in Christ. You don't even understand that. If you, you, you won the spiritual lottery of eternity. Do you know what you have in Christ? Do you know what you have? You are complete. The word complete means packed up, stacked to the full, made mature, brought to perfection, brought to a level of fullness and completeness. You are everything you will ever need to be, not because of what you do, but because of the fact that you are in Him. He's the answer. He's the answer. And you're in the answer. Alan Iverson, you're not the answer. Sorry. Basketball fans would know what I mean. Jesus. He's the one. Yes, he's the only one. Let him have his way until the day is done. How's it go? When he speaks, you'll know. Those dark clouds. <laughs> Every dark cloud has got to go. Just because he loves you. He loves you. And in this conflict of life, in this barrage of emotion and confusion, there's a light. There's a stability. There's a strength that can be yours by simply keeping your eyes. Keep playing that up, if you would. On Jesus. Would you stand with me tonight? Mm -hmm. Oh, Jesus is the one. Yes, he is the only one. congregation, those of you watching by television. It's not complicated. 
it's not too hard for us to understand. He simply asks for us to believe that nearly 2,000 years ago he came to this earth and died a sinner's death as payment for my sin and yours. And a simple statement of faith that says, Jesus, I accept you as Lord and Savior is enough to get you started. You don't even have to quote a verse. You don't have to be in church. Simple faith that comes from the heart, extended to the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you. And those of you in this building, I know most of you, I know that most of you, if not all of you, are already saved. But the answer that you sometimes are so confused about, the situation that you're so confused about, I hope tonight brought it back to the simplicity of simply trusting in Jesus, that he's the one as you have received Christ Jesus, so walk ye in him. Oh, Jesus is the one. Yes, he is the only one. Man is until Sunday morning. you were blessed and enjoyed this live service from Family Worship Center. Family Worship Center, located in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, at Jimmy Swaggart Ministries, holds three services weekly, Sunday morning at 10 a.m., Sunday evening at 6 p.m., and Wednesday at 7 p.m., all Central Time. All services are broadcast live on the Sun Life Broadcasting Network, Sun Life Radio, online at sunlifetv.com, and on the free SBN Now app. To join the Family Worship Center Media Church, call one 800 288-8350 or join at jsm.org. Live services are produced by the Sun Life Broadcasting Network.